So today we are going to be going over Sergey's 14th pic 10 f 200 tutorial. And today we are going to be creating a robot with an ultrasonic sensor. This is the chassis that we've used in the past couple of uh, tutorials, but today we are going to be using this ultrasonic sensor. And all we're going to be doing is setting this up so that it continuously goes forward until it comes within about four centimeters of an object. And once it gets within four centimeters, which is about two inch, two ish inches, then it detects it and backs up and then keeps on going forward. And so that's basically all we're going to do. In this video, I'm going to be going over things from a high level, kind of talking about the concept of the ultrasonic sensor and some of the trickier parts of the code. But if you do have any particular questions about the code that I mentioned, and you're like, wait, what is he saying? Sergey has done a very, very in-depth written tutorial. Go check it out on circuitbread.com. He will answer basically any questions you have that I simply cannot get to to make this video at least reasonably long. Okay, with that, let's start out with the ultrasonic sensor and first how ultrasonic sensors in general work and then how this particular one works. So the way an ultrasonic sensor works is it emits a sound, usually a ping, some sort of encoded ping that it can recognize. It sends that sound out, that sound goes, hits something and comes back and then it detects that sound. And so as soon as it shoots that sound out, it starts a timer. And then as soon as it detects that sound, it stops that timer. It takes that amount of time in seconds, multiplies it by approximately 340 meters per second, or exactly 340 meters per second, depending on the settings here, and then divides that by two because you need to take into account that the signal is going out and back. And then it figures out in meters exactly how far away something is. And that is the basic idea of ultrasonic sensors in general. Now this one, this is a very, very common ultrasonic sensor that's been simplified. So all you have to do is send it a trigger signal. And then as soon as it receives that trigger signal, it takes care of the ping encoding and the detection. It just takes the echo pin and puts it high as soon as it sends out the pulse. And then as soon as it receives the pulse in return, it drops it. So it takes care of all of that sound detection and all that sort of stuff. And all we have to do with the microcontroller is to measure the amount of time that the echo pin was high, and then we can do the calculations ourselves. So in reality, these things are pretty simple and doing that simple multiplication and division is quite straightforward. Even though with assembly, as we're using here, it's a little bit more complicated. If we're using C, it'd be incredibly simple, but it's a little bit more complicated with assembly, but that is okay. So that's the general idea here, is what we are going to do is we're gonna take some code that's going to send out a trigger to the ultrasonic sensor on a regular basis, going to measure that amount of time, and as long as the distance isn't less than four centimeters, we're just going to do our subroutine that has us moving forward. And then if it does detect something within four centimeters, it'll say, oh yeah, let's jump into our reverse subroutine do that reverse subroutine, and then start the detection process all over again. And that's the basic architecture of what we are going to be doing in assembly today. So two things before we jump into the code. First, we will go over it, but in the code, we set GP1 as trigger and GP3 as echo. So that's gonna be important as we're going through, just when you're looking at the code, making sure like you understand what's actually going on. Second, this particular ultrasonic sensor that I'm using, and it's what Sergey recommended in the written tutorial, it does not do well with high voltages. And because we have a limited amount of pins on our PIC-10F200, we need to share some pins with the VPP programming line with our PIC-4. So when you are programming the PIC-10F200, remove that line that goes to your ultrasonic sensor to the VPP line, make sure it's disconnected or else you're gonna be getting upwards of 12 volts on your ultrasonic sensor and you have a high likelihood of frying it. So that's in the tutorial. I'm gonna say it again. When you're doing this, make sure you don't do that because you don't wanna fry the ultrasonic sensor because I mean, most of us don't have a bunch of these laying around. Some of us do, but most of us don't. You don't wanna fry it unnecessarily. Okay, so with that, let's jump into the code itself. So this is one of the simpler codes that we've done in quite a while. So um, there's actually only one particular part that I'm gonna go over in depth. Otherwise, I'm just gonna kind of clarify what each section does. So as we know, lines one through basically eight, that's all just definitions, nothing, nothing unique. 10 through 15 is just your initialization. And you can see there that we are setting GP0, GP1, and GP2 as outputs. And that's all we are doing in the initialization. Then in 16, we're in the loop. We're in the main portion of our 
program. So the first thing we do is we set GP1 high, and then we do a 10 microsecond delay by just doing basically uh, no-op instructions that go to current location plus one. It's just killing time, um, but it's very specific time, which is exactly what we want. Um, what we are doing here with GP1, if you remember, that's the trigger. So we are telling the microcontroller with a 10 second trigger signal that, hey, we want you to take a sample right here. So from lines 17 through 23, we've basically got GP1 high, waited 10 microseconds, and then dropped GP1 down low. Now, in 24, we move three, the number three, into our W, or our working register, and that's gonna be important later. Right now, that seems random. We'll get back to that later. This is part of that more complicated portion. Um, but don't worry about it so much right now. And then in 25, we are checking for the echo line to go high. So to get the timing exactly right, we send the trigger, we wait for that echo line to go high, and then we'll wait for the echo line to drop. So in 25, we are waiting for the echo to go high. And then as soon as it does go high, we stop doing that 25 and 26 loop, and we jump to 27 where we clear timer zero. So now that's resetting timer zero and starting it from scratch. And then in 28 and 29, we're doing basically the same thing as we did in 25 and 26, but the exact opposite by waiting for it to go low. And then as soon as it goes low, then we jump to 30. Now 30 through 31, surprisingly, is probably the most complicated part of this whole thing. So we'll come back to this in just a second. So that's important. Just 30 and 31 is where we decide whether or not we're close enough to something or we're not. So if in 30, 30 and 31, we decide that we are not too close to anything, we jump to line 33, which 33 through 39 is simply a subroutine that controls both of our servos and says, go forward. And that's it. it. Once it says go forward, it jumps back to the beginning of the loop where it's doing the trigger and the echo detection, all that sort of stuff. Very straightforward. Now, if it says, hey, there is something close, then it jumps to line 40, where it has that in line 32, go to move backward, which is line 40. It does basically the same thing as move forward, but it has one of the servos moving backwards and one of them moving forward. So you get that twisting tank motion, goes through, does the steps backward, and then it's done. And then it goes back to the beginning and starts the whole thing, which you got in lines 53 up until the very end in 83 are simply our delay subroutines, which we have gone over in depth in previous tutorials and also the way we control the servos, which again, we've gone over in other tutorials. So again, very, very straightforward. We're just, is it close or not? Forward, back. Is it close or not? Forward, back. That's all we're doing. So going back to the most complicated portion of this is in line 24, where we, where we put the number three into our working register, and then in lines 30 and 31, where we are taking our timer zero and subtracting W from that. So basically, if the result is one, you skip the next line. If it's not, you execute the next line. All right, so I'm gonna have to look at my notes to explain this so I don't screw up the numbers here exactly. But the reason we chose these values is because we know the clock cycle, we know how fast the speed of sound is, and we can basically figure out how much distance there is per cycle. So where we get the numbers for this is that we know that timer zero is set up to be at a prescaler of one to 128. So each timer tick takes 128 microseconds. Uh, we also know that we can get one centimeter of measurement for every 59 microseconds. So each timer tick is actually 128 microseconds divided by 59. So each timer tick is actually 2.1-ish centimeters. So when we load the value into the working register, we would expect to have two ticks to give us 4.2 centimeters, close enough to four centimeters. So that's, that's the rationale. That's why we chose to put the value three in there. Okay, so, so you just, wait a second, you just said two, why are we saying three? What we're doing is we're measuring two timer ticks to give us the four centimeters. But when we look at the code and what's going on is we're actually looking at the carry bit 
and seeing whether or not it's set. In line 30, we have W being subtracted from timer zero. And in 31, we're actually checking to see if the carry bit in the status register is going to be one or zero. Now, if let's just say timer zero is five, five minus three, that gives you two. There's no carry bit because it didn't have to pull any number from anywhere else. Four minus three, no carry bit, didn't have to pull anything from anywhere else. But if you have three minus three, zero, you still aren't pulling anything up. Two minus three gives you a negative number. It has to carry from somewhere else. It, it flags that carry bit. It says, oh yes, this is a negative number. So even though we're looking for two ticks, the reason we put three in the working register is because two minus three is, once, is the way we get that flag bit set in the status register. Okay, so I hope that made sense. I hope that clarified what is potentially the only confusing part of all of this. At least that was the only part that I took a little while to figure out what was going on because again, it's like, oh, I want two, so I need to have three, but it's the two minus the three, and then it's the carry bit. And it just took a moment. So if that doesn't make sense, I'm sorry. You can listen to it again. You can go check out Sergey's written tutorial. But other than that, this code is very, very straightforward. So I'm actually going to hook this up to the oscilloscope and give it some power. And then I'm going to show how the pulses change in their width as I get closer and farther away so that you can see that it's actually sending out a different signal. Like, oh, hey, it's closer and it sends a different signal to the servo. So let's do that really quick. Okay, so let's give this thing some power and we're going to look at the servo pulses and see how they change as I get closer and farther away from the sensor. Okay, so you can see those pulses, they're happening about every, oh yeah, five milliseconds, one, two, three, four, five, so between five and six divisions, so about 25-ish milliseconds apart. As I put my hand closer, you can hear the motor change pitch, and then you can also see those come closer together. Pull it out, and there we go. So this is a lot lamer than Sergey's quite cool demonstration. So he provided me a video. So we will go over and show his video of it working in a fully mobile live environment. So that's about it. Uh, this is actually really straightforward and it's fantastic because ultrasonic sensors are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. They're in cars, they're on robots, they're used in sensing for liquids, for grain silos, all sorts of stuff. So this is really, really quite cool. I think this is the last tutorial we are going to be using this tank chassis on so we can say goodbye and thank you for your service, golden chassis of power. If you found this tutorial helpful or useful, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel, all of that good stuff, and we will see you in the next one. Have a great one. Hey, I hope this tutorial was helpful. Did you know that circuitbread.com also has more useful engineering content? In addition to the tutorials, textbooks, tools, and other things, we have dozens of EE FAQs that explain quick, standalone concepts that are helpful for electrical engineers. Go check them out.